Hello, I'm Dr. Larry Maurice with NeuroLaser Foundation. Hello, I'm Dr. Theodore Henderson with the Synaptic Space and the NeuroLaser Foundation. In this article, we present an argument concerning the ability of near-infrared light to penetrate into the human brain to provide effective therapeutic doses to deep brain regions. The ability of near-infrared light to penetrate to sufficient depth with sufficient energy to exert a biological effect on the brain is a key issue. First, we review the relevant pathophysiological mechanisms of neural injury which unfold following a traumatic brain injury. Then, the postulated mechanisms of near-infrared light in mitigating these mechanisms are presented. The physical properties of light and the manner in which it interacts with tissue are then elucidated. With this background, we then present data from a series of laboratory studies quantifying the penetration of near-infrared light from a number of light sources. We feel that the crucial point of this article is that existing assumptions about the penetration of near-infrared light, which underlie current uses of this technology, are in fact faulty. Our experimental data demonstrate that point, and thus are a vital part of the argument put forth in this article along with a companion paper which describes the use of near-infrared light in the range of 8 to 13 watts to successfully treat traumatic brain injury in a group of 10 patients, this article heralds a paradigm shift in the field of photobiomodulation. We detail the factors regulating the penetration of near-infrared light through skin, bone, tissue, and brain. Absorption, refraction, and scatter are discussed. Also, the role of light coherence and light pulsing in increasing the penetration of photonic energy are considered. Current data indicates that near-infrared wavelengths of between 600 and 1,000 nanometers are absorbed by the cytochrome C oxidase in the mitochondria. This increases ATP and activates secondary molecular and cellular events. Early response genes are activated and the expression of numerous genes is altered. In fact, research shows that there is increased transcription of over 100 genes, in particular cell survival genes, neural differentiation factors are transcribed, synapse formation is increased, and growth factors are activated. Work by Carew, Hamlin, Lapchat, Naser, Anders, Fitzgerald, and others have established that near-infrared light can alter mitochondrial function and prevent or repair some of the damage caused by traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, or stroke. However, animal models are far different from the clinical situation, both in terms of necessary depths to which the light needs to penetrate and the thickness of the skull. This raises serious questions about the utility of LED and other devices operating in the milliwatt range. In contrast, a 10-watt infrared laser with combined 810 and 980 nanometer wavelength showed 9% of the incident energy penetrated 2 millimeters of skin. Pulsing the light increased penetration with 13.8% of the incident photonic energy penetrating 2 millimeters of skin. Our laboratory studies have shown that low powered infrared light in the milliwatt range does not penetrate a full thickness section of human skin. We've also found that low power devices do not deliver any significant infrared energy to a depth of three centimeters into the brain. Very recent work by others supports our findings. For near infrared light to penetrate to the brain and impact neurological injury, say stroke or TBI, or neurological disease, it must be able to reach the depths of the brain with sufficient fluence to trigger molecular events. It is not sufficient to reach the cortical surface, as a neurological disease involves areas beyond the cortical surface. Indeed, near-infrared photonic energy may need to reach steps of 3 to 7 centimeters. For example, spec neuroimaging studies of traumatic brain injury, as shown here, reveal that TBI most frequently involves the ventral surfaces of the frontal lobes and the anterior and medial temporal lobes, which on the average are 5 to 7 centimeters from the surface of the skull. Based on our studies of infrared light penetration through skin, it came as little surprise that infrared light from LED systems 
operating in the 50 to 500 milliwatt range demonstrated absolutely no penetration through skin, skull, and brain to the depth of 3 centimeters. We used a bisected head of a lamb obtained fresh from a slaughterhouse for these studies. We found that a 6 watt LED with a 980 nanometer wavelength could scarcely be detected at 3 centimeters depth with less than 1 one hundredth of a percent of the incident light reaching 3 centimeters. In contrast, Higher powered laser devices did deliver detectable photonic energy into the depths of the brain through skull and overlying tissue. We compared energy readings of infrared light penetrating 3 centimeters of air versus 3 centimeters of skin, skull, tissue, and brain of the bisected head of a lamp. 99.65% of the light is lost from a 10 watt, 810, 980 nanometer combined laser device. Penetration was somewhat better with a higher 15 watt, 810 nanometer laser device. Here we saw that 2.9% of the incident photonic energy reached the depths of 3 centimeters. Temperature changes at the skin surface ranged from 0.2 to 3 degrees centigrade. Temperature changes in the brain were less than 1 degree centigrade. Our laboratory studies have shown that low powered infrared light in the milliwatt range does not penetrate a full thickness section of human skin. We've also found that low power devices do not deliver any significant infrared energy to a depth of three centimeters into the brain. Very recent work by others supports our findings of the need for higher powered infrared light sources to reach the depths of the brain. For example, Juanita Anders and colleagues showed penetration to a level of four centimeters and to the inner aspects of the dura mater using a 5 watt continuous laser. Also, Pitsky and colleagues used cadaver human head to show that 1 watt infrared laser could penetrate through the back of the sphenoid sinus to approximately 2.5 centimeters into brain tissue. Extensive research has shown that fluence within the range of 0.9 joules per centimeter squared to 15 joules per centimeter squared at this target site for treatment, in this case deep within the brain, is most effective in activating the biological processes involved in reversing and mitigating the pathophysiological effects of traumatic brain injury. The attenuation of near-infrared energy as it passes through tissue has been examined in computer simulations, animal tissue, and human tissue. Near-infrared penetration into the human brain is subject to attenuation by multiple tissues, skin, skull, dura, blood, cerebral spinal fluid, and multiple interfaces which scatter, absorb, and reflect the near-infrared light to varying degrees. We have shown through the use of higher wattage near-infrared lasers that we can deliver fluence at therapeutic levels to the depths of the brain without tissue heating or damage. The protocols have been applied in our clinic with excellent clinical results and no side effects. As shown here, perfusion spec scans before on the top and after treatment on the bottom show improved function throughout the cortex as seen on superior views on the left and right lateral views on the right. The area of direct cortical damage in the right temporal lobe shows no change at the arrow, but surrounding cortex show significant improvement. In a companion paper, we've used infrared lasers in the power range of 10 to 15 watts to treat patients with traumatic brain injury. In a series of 10 patients with traumatic brain injuries, all in the mild to moderate categories and duration since injury ranging from months to 10 years, we have found clinical improvement in all cases.